I'd just lost my stepsister to breast cancer at 36, six months before I got my diagnosis. And I was about to go through Christmas with my family and I couldn't tell them because I didn't want them to know because they didn't, at that stage, I didn't know if it was benign or malignant. So for me, that first year of kind of being diagnosed was painful because I couldn't share it with a lot of people. I just had my kind of immediate universe. I couldn't tell my family. I couldn't understand it fully. I did not know what, how it was going to shape my future or if I had a future. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Matt Brown, and you're listening to the Every L Podcast. Each episode, we'll have a different guest come on and talk about when life hands you an L, is it really a loss or is it something else? Because not every L's a loss. So sit back, relax, or do whatever you guys do to get comfortable as we get into this. Let's go. Hello and welcome to another episode of Every Old Podcast where we have different guests come on and talk about situations in their life where at the time they were stacking things up and it was meant to go one way and instead it didn't go that way at all. It went a different way. How do they deal with it? How do they overcome it? What emotions did they feel? What support was available to them? Did they respond in a negative or positive way? We're going to find out because I'm sure each and every one of us have been in situations where we plan things to go a certain way and for whatever reason it didn't happen. And then we're then left with a decision to make in terms of how we react. When you're in the midst of a situation like that, it's very easy to not understand the long-term ramifications of such situation. But through hearing the stories of different individuals, hopefully it will paint a better picture of what your reality could look like if you just stayed the course and kept going rather than giving up these guests are going to talk about their lived experiences because they're kind enough to come on and share them i cannot stress how much i am grateful for each and every one of my guests for coming and sharing what they do because it's a very sensitive and intimate conversation we'll be having but it's all in hope that it will give people hope inspiration let them feel less alone and acknowledge that their situation isn't favorable but it doesn't mean that they're right now is there forever. I'm going to say something that's always cliche, but I, I stand by it. It's fine. I stand by it. I have a fantastic guest. <laughs> Her name is Steph. Steph, I've known, oof, which feels like a lifetime ago now, but she is a fantastic, fantastic individual. What she doesn't know mainly, I don't, actually, I don't think she knows this. I met her shortly. No, I think I met her during my massive bout of depression and anxiety which I don't think I was able to necessarily articulate in such a way but we were vlogging and she she helped host this Vader uh, vlog every day in April or August depending on which month you're in and she was just such an accommodating individual she was nice she got together a nice little community and she would be responsive just a really pleasant person and it was something I didn't know I needed, especially since I was entering into a space that I hadn't entered in before. I'd watch YouTube, but I'd never got involved in it. I never had the time to. I was always in work. And when work went left instead of right, and I had time on my side because I was depressed and had anxiety, I kind of faked it. I wanted to let people think I was okay. So I would say I was okay, but my face wouldn't match it. So then I started doing videos. I started doing little things like that. And eventually I got into Vader because it then pushed me to be more... Um, to edit things in a quicker pace and be more creative. And that's when I stumbled across Steph. Steph, from a distance, watching what she's done, what she's achieved, she's nothing short of amazing. Very dedicated career woman at the time in terms of what she did, how high she climbed the ladder, what she sustained doing, which I think is important because many of us can achieve certain things, but can we sustain it? Different conversation altogether. But she's always come across as authentic and selfless in what she does. I have a soft spot for her for the reasons where whether she knew it or not, she helped me in a massive way just by allowing that space to be created for me to to enter in and to occupy. But now we're talking, oh my gosh, life is very different. Things are very different from where she was to where she is now. However, I'm so grateful for her to come on, to share her story and 
to let us know a little bit more about what her journeys look like from where she was to where she is. Anyway, I think that was a very long intro. I do apologise. Steph, how are you doing? Matt, I am good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on as your guest. And I am so pleased that what I did with Vader and the vlogging helped you at that time because it's it's incredible, the power of community. And that's why social media kind of lifted me out of a bit of down space as well and social media in general and then vlogging was that next level for me and it really really helped me not only personally but professionally like connecting with people I, I've met some lifelong friends through that community one of them being yourself as well and um, I think it's this is why I'm so excited about the podcast space as well because it, we're getting to see each other we can see each other you guys can hear us <laughs> um but uh we get to interact again and it's we're not hiding behind the walls which in the state of depression and anxiety you are confined within the walls of your own mind and until you step out of that and until you have those moments where you just talk uh uh it doesn't matter what you're saying but just that act um that physical act of talking really, really takes your mind somewhere else and allows you to kind of get through into a space and you can go, I didn't think about that for a second. Okay, I'm all right. Everything's going to be okay. And you can move forward. So I'm really pleased I helped you. And I didn't know that. It's fine. It's fine. You wasn't to know. I wasn't in the right headspace and I was just trying to get through. And yeah, as I said, you facilitated and I greatly appreciate it. So do you mind sharing an introduction of yourself that you feel comfortable sharing before we go on into your first L? Absolutely. So I am Steph or Stephanie, depending on who, who you speak to and where you find me on social media. I am a mum of a two-year-old. Um, but more importantly, I'm a solo mum. Uh, solo by choice. I have my daughter through fertility treatment and that is a big part of who I am now and the very different part of who I was when I met you, Matt. So uh, prior to that, uh, and still currently, I am a marketing consultant. I work in social media. Um, I do a bit of yoga where I can, but I used to be a teacher as well on the side of running an agency. Uh, so life was very, very full um, with many, many things until about two years ago. And now it's very, very full with two things, my daughter and my cat. Um, actually, probably three, because my work does come into play as well. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is a very different type of full now with your daughter. Yeah, exactly. Completely different job. Uh, completely different hierarchy of prioritise. Prioritise? Priorities. <laughs> See, that's the whole point, right, folks? And you probably identify Parents struggle with their vocabulary now because we can't use words with too many syllables around youngsters. We have to simplify it. So when it when it sort of caps beyond three syllables, you're like, ah, oh, let's. How do I shorten this? I did, oh, do you know what? I'm not ready for adult conversations right now. But it is. I mean, fine. I am the the worst at, at kind of getting my daughter to say words to see if she can say them. Um, helicopter was fun for a while, but now it's kamumbumba. Uh, is oh, a wow. cucumber. <laughs> Wow. Wow. That's interesting. To be fair, <laughs> I'm super lazy and people can come at me for it if they want to. You choose my friend for stuff like that. Miss Rachel is just there for that. I just have to correct them on, it's not Z, it's Z. And I don't care if you listen to America or Canada or wherever you're at and you say Z, that's over there. Over here we say Z. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah. I, 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 I utilize a resource I have available to me to help me educate my children to the standard they need to be i am i am very much pro watching tv and youtube and doing all those things with my child because that i need another person to be able to help me do this but also i'm learning on the job um that the amount of things in kids tv and movies these days which are actually targeted at adults is fascinating and i remember reading malcolm gladwell's book years ago around um the creation of sesame street and how that evolved over time. And he talks about how it was created for kids, but the parents weren't paying attention to the kids. And so the kids were getting bored. And so they started kind of putting more things in that would help the audience connect. Um, and so that the families could then sit down together and watch the show. And I loved like hearing the fact that they don't even considered all of that. And now 
watching things like Bing or um, uh, what else is there? I can't even think now. Another problem with being a parent. <laughs> Too many like, TV shows that are on that you can't remember. But so many of them, I sit there and go, wow, this is amazing. I'm learning something from this. Uh, like in Canto, like you learn about how it started off with a, sorry, spoiler alert if anyone hasn't watched it, but you, you hear how the grandma started off with the right intentions, but over time how she conducted herself trying to maintain that yeah, the people that potentially hurt during that time, and it's just a way of us sort of say, "Oh, maybe I should stop and just check and see how other people are feeling about what's being said and done, and how I might make them feel if they're not center stage, sort of thing." Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so many, so many good uh, line storylines in Encanto. I love it. My daughter's favorite, hundred percent, and good music too. Uh, brilliant music. Right. So the first L you said you'd like to discuss, and I say first because it's is a second one we just don't know if it's going to be on this episode or another you'll have to wait and see the loss of the possibility of being a mother now reading that oh sounds a bit challenging because me not being a woman was never really a thought for me if I'm honest because I just assumed that if I wanted a child I'd be able to have a child as I got older I realized life isn't like that you've got to make sure but well, there's a lot of factors in, to take into consideration that you may not have been privy to when you was growing up. But as a woman, I would like to assume, and I say like, so I like to think I've understood it. There is this unspoken expectation of you that you will one day bear a child. And then that becomes embedded into your being that I have a timer. I must give birth to an, an offspring at some point. And that is sort of like the, 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 the main catalyst of it all but how you get there oh that's a different ball game altogether so when I saw it I was like oh yeah you were super career driven so what happened there so yeah if you don't mind start at the top where you feel it's appropriate and yeah share what happened yeah absolutely so you're absolutely right it is definitely there's a there is a pressure cooker of time that kind of goes against every single woman who wants a child and I ex- expressly say once because not everybody does and that is okay yeah correct you know that I see so many stories about um there's one this morning reading about Kim Cattrall and how she hates the term childless at 66 because she chose not to have one but she's not childless uh she's just a woman and that's it so but for me that wasn't my narrative like there was always in in, uh, a little voice in my head saying you're going to be a mom you're going to be a mum. And for me, like even my mid twenties, I knew that that's something I wanted. But as you say, career, big part of my life as well. Uh, but also I was eternally single. Like I'm just, I've dated here and there, but I am just not, unfortunately, <laughs> for whatever reason, <laughs> I am not the person that people choose to be with or, and I have not found somebody that I want to be with either. But yeah, I guess basically getting into my late twenties, like I was like, well, you know, maybe you know, I need to start looking, I need to start working a bit harder at this dating game and all the rest of it. But then I had a massive spanner in the works when I was twenty nine, and I got diagnosed with. I'm going to caveat with I'm fine. I promise you, I'm fine. A brain tumor. It's low grade and it's benign. But it was not something I was expecting to find. It was completely by accident that I found it. I had some blood tests to kind of check some hormone levels because I was feeling a bit off. And they uh, they spotted some white mass in my left temporal lobe is the way they described it to me, which obviously as a 29-year-old, you're like, uh-huh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and brain tumor wasn't really something that I had been privy to kind of knowing anybody who'd had one before either. But that didn't, that wasn't the stopper yet. So basically from that point onwards, I was scanned regularly just to check and see if it would change or grow. And it never has, which is good. So I'm now 43. So several years later, um, it's still pretty steady, but they did say to me, were you to experience any symptoms of change, those could present themselves in the form of seizures. And it got to about uh, I was about 34. So about five years later, I experienced my first seizure. I woke up in the morning. I was really disorientated. I knew something had happened. I kind of told my housemate, I was like, don't feel quite right. I think I might've had a seizure. She was like, 
oh are you okay I was like yeah I got a bit of a headache she went okay we're going to Westfield do you want to come I went she's gonna have a shower first <laughs> I went had a shower and walked around Westfield I had to a couple of Nurofen and I just, I just didn't know what to do and then I was like do you think I should call my GP and she's like yeah maybe and so I did and I spoke to him and he was like right okay why didn't you call anybody but you just you're in a state of confusion as well so and I was like, oh, does this mean I'm epileptic? He said, no. He said, but if you have another one within six months, then yes, technically you're medically epileptic. Lo and behold, almost to the day, I had two on the same day. I woke up and then fell asleep and woke up again. And I woke up a second time to paramedics in my in my bedroom. So all very scary, quite disorientating. I remember phoning my boss at the time while I was in the back of the ambulance going, I'm going to be in in a minute. I'm just, I'm just going to go and get checked out. And then I'll, I'll be in as soon as I can. I'm really sorry. Like (laughs) my friend was like, taking your phone away. We're just going to put that here. We're going to get you sorted. And I was in hospital for a couple of days while they just kind of uh, kept an eye on me and made sure I was okay. Set me up with medication and things like that. Um, And since then I've been on very low dose of um, epilepsy medication every day. I've never had a seizure since, but shortly after that, you start talking to people about what the next steps, what do you do, what do you need to look out for? Because I've got the brain tumour and it wasn't just a straight seizure, let's go down the epilepsy route, um, I was referred to neuro-oncology and the team there, the doctor turned around and said, "Uh, are you thinking of having children? And I was like, well, One day, yeah. And he was like, well, I'd advise against that. I wouldn't do that at all. If you have a pregnancy, you're probably going to miscarry. And if you don't miscarry, you'll probably have a seizure and die. And that could kill you and the baby. Take a deep breath. Wow. Yeah. So, like I say, I'm sitting there a couple of months prior going, oh, you know, maybe I should think about dating. Then suddenly I get this massive curveball from somebody who is very high ranking in the medical chain telling me, don't even think about it. And I had to walk away, somehow process everything that was going on and essentially started to grieve for motherhood because I was just like, well, that's, that's just not an option for me because an authority had told me so. And so that's where my L began. Wow. Okay, folks, you you understand now why I said she was kind of like a workaholic. Mm. My girl is getting treated as that, oh, I'll be in a bit, I'll be in a bit. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Get yourself sorted out first. Could I ask... When you got told that you potentially wasn't able to have a child because you would maybe miscarriage or have a seizure and you both pass, what was that like? And what support did you have at the time? Because if if wanting to be a parent was something that was important to you, it was kind of like, it it wasn't like, it's a bit, I don't know. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Was it a burning desire to be a parent at that point? It was definitely a desire. It wasn't like I have to do it tomorrow, but it was definitely something that I wanted to do. So it was something that was on your to-do list, effectively. But then to suddenly say, yeah, that 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 task right there, that's not going to be achieved ever. How did you process that? And who was there to help you process that information? So you, I don't think I did really process it straight on. So like much like you were saying at the beginning, you know, when we're, we're dealing with like big issues, you tend to kind of throw yourself into something else. And so I had to kind of like tell people because that's how I process things. I was like, oh, yeah, that's what they said. But again, like my peers weren't necessarily at that stage all thinking about becoming parents themselves. They were still only in their late 20s. And it was like, oh, right, OK, well, you don't have to worry about that yet because you're not with anyone anyway. That was kind of the vibe I was getting. And so you just it's like someone saying to me, one day you could be a millionaire and the next day going, or oh, you couldn't. And so I was like, well, if it's. It is possible, but now it's just off the table. Maybe I just have to accept that that's the way it is. But equally, in my back of my head, I was like, I need to have a plan B. So I was like, it's fine. When the time comes to it, I'll just adopt or something. And I'll just kind of like, I'll leave it down to whatever the situation is. Or I might meet someone who's already got a kid. Or, you know, you start to kind of like think about other ways in which you could manifest that child in your life, but just not 
the way you you saw it but you know the other point you touched on there is you know you could die and I'd already had that you know a year or so well five years or so um prior with the with the brain tumor because the you know when a doctor says to you please don't google this when you go home (laughs) no it's going to be bad yeah but it's like pandora's box you gotta open it like yeah. you like there's nothing that's going to stop you doing it but i've got a smartphone in my hand like really did i was 2009 smartphone time i can't remember yeah we would have had smartphones there too we would have had smartphones there. we we i remember yeah we had we had color we had wap in like yeah. 2001 yeah, so mm-hmm. by 2009 we would have had smartphones yeah, mine probably would have been a 3G or something. We would have had smartphones, just don't think Web, WebMD would have been there. Yeah, no, well, if you Google what I've got, it will tell you you've got 10 years. So, like, I was like, I'd, I'd already had that, and then then this one on top. And so I just basically went on this, right, if I'm not going to be around tomorrow, what do I want to get done? And I'd already started that a little bit with my kind of like with the brain tumor diagnosis. So I started traveling and kind of like doing things. But you, you're, all your kind of, your fears just kind of get thrown out the window a little bit. So I'd go and zip line in Costa Rica or I'd dangle down a crevasse in Alaska or I went face to face with a silverback in Rwanda because I was just like, I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow, but I may as well just get stuff done while I'm here. Face to face, was it like plexiglass between you and them? No, I literally we we went to the Virunga Mountains and we hiked for about four hours, and you get to this enclosure and you're allowed to spend up to like an hour in the space. They when you when I say we hiked for four hours, you could be hiking for five minutes or the eight hours. You're just trying to track where they are, and so you once you stumble across them, they're like, great, you can have an hour with these guys, but then we need to go because we're in their space, but we basically we were kind of stood in this kind of area and we were watching some of the others there and all of a sudden he just walks out like on all like walking on all fours like but massive so probably his back came up to like my chest height and he just came through and I there's a video of me I'll send it to you later literally he kind of walks past and I am backing into some bamboo and he goes straight past and then all of his little kind of clan, his family, all follow them in age rank all the way to the end. And then you've got a little baby one on the back of the last mama. It's so cute. But I was literally inches in my It's like, oh, my God, this is a silverback. Um, but had I never had my diagnosis, I would have never even thought about doing that. So when it comes to, like, things that shift and shape the way that your future goes – both being diagnosed with the tumour and the epilepsy threw me into spaces that have literally made me who I am today. And I'm so, so grateful for them as as kind of like twisted as that sounds. I mean, did I have people around me that were kind of like there to support me? I, I was living in a house share of four, with four other girls um, and they were around. I have some really good mates, which was lovely. But nobody knew really knew what to do. And I didn't really know what I needed. Um, and so it was literally just fly by the seat of my pants. Let's do some blogging. Let's do some vlogging. Let's do loads of cool stuff at work. Let's make sure that I'm doing stuff that makes me happy. All the the very cliche things to be doing, especially as a Londoner, just kind of get your teeth stuck in and, and crack on. It sounds like you had the, and I don't want to say classic case because that would be rude of me to say it, make it sound so blasé. But when people are told or had big uh, life-changing news shared to them their perspective shifts and it becomes I would like to believe this to be the case I guess once you get over that grief curve um, I did speak about the grief curve on a previous episode if people want to check that out please do um, but the grief curve is basically the series of emotions you go through when something happens and you're grieving over someone and that includes um, depression um, acceptance, integration, uh, frustration, a whole bunch of emotions, but definitely check out the grief curve, which is very similar to the change curve. But 
when you do that, I guess you're of the mentality potentially when you're about to integrate and accept what your new reality could be is live full, die empty. You don't want to leave anything behind where you felt I could have, I should have, but I didn't when I could. No, absolutely. And it, that, that was pretty much my, it was like, just do it. Like my, I remember seeing a tweet when I was doing fundraising for the Brain Tumor Charity and it said, does anybody want a place in the marathon? We've got, we've got one in Brighton. Um, it's in six weeks. And I called my dad and said, and we've got Reading next week. Do you want to do Brighton in six weeks time? And he went, you're all right. And I went, oh, by the way, it's a marathon, not a half. And we did it. And I ended up doing three. I did London, Brighton and Paris. Um, but all because again, like you just live full. So, um, that was all good until I got a letter through and then it said, you've got an appointment with your epilepsy specialist. And I went, Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know I had an epilepsy specialist. So I went along to an appointment there and he did all the kind of routine. How are you feeling? Have you had any seizures, any symptoms, blah, 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 all the kind of normal jazz. And I must have parked it to the back of my mind a little bit, but subconsciously, when he turned around and said, is there anything else you want to ask me? I went, yeah, actually, I'm sure it's going to, you're going to give me the same answer, but um, I was told not to have children because I have epilepsy. I was like, I'm sure there are epileptics that do have children, but I'm guessing, you know, obviously my case is more complicated. And he went, no. So I don't know who told you that. So you have got as much chance as anybody of having a very healthy pregnancy. You're on the lowest dosage of medication. There is no risk to you or the child that I can see because you've had no seizures whatsoever since you've been medicated. So I don't know who told you that, but they're absolutely wrong. That sounds conflicting because you've got someone who was, like you said, quite high up in the hierarchy. Yeah. And now you've got someone else who you respect, who's a specialist in their field and one says absolutely no yeah the other one saying i don't know who you've been talking to that's a straight 50 50 split what do you do with that then you take the good one fair enough fair enough i was like there's there's something like through all the kind of uh gazillion appointments i've had over the last decade or so that the one thing i have kind of learned whether it's your gp or you know whoever um the more generalist their knowledge, the more kind of sure they are to tell you not to do something because they don't know if they tell you the, that you can, that they'll get it wrong. So if they prevent you from doing something, the risk to them is minimal, even though devastation might be bigger for you. Um, and And so when this guy gave me hope, the first thing I did was like, right, how old am I? Okay, I'm 37 now. Right can I still have kids? Um, because it was just one of those things. It's like, yeah. you just, you parked it for so long. I was like, oh my God, I better get checked. So I actually had a, a fertility MOT. I went and did loads of kind of like tests on your, on your body to kind of see what your egg count might be like, or like if you're kind of like fallopian tubes work properly and all those kind of jazzy things. And I sat down with this woman afterwards and kind of had a little debrief on what she thought the results kind of like told me. And uh, she was basically, she's like, you've got a womb of a 25 year old. And I was like, yeah, get in. <laughs> um, she's like, you know what? If it was me, I'd just go out on Friday, Saturday night, see what, you know, oh, see damn. what your chances. I'm like, this is so unprofessional. And also, you're a very expensive clinic, so you can make a lot of money out of me. <laughs> um, but again, I kind of took that as a, all oh, right, okay, green light, that's fine. Cue Matthew McConaughey reference. If you haven't read that book or listened to it, recommend um but yeah green light for me so I was like okay that's okay I can just park that for now okay well maybe let's start working towards that um so again it was kind of like you know do I look on the dating scene do I kind of look out other options with this clinic to see down the fertility route and then life took me off in another different direction I started doing yoga teacher training and um I started teaching yoga after work and so my life was getting more and more full and and then I was kind of like, I just feel like something's missing and I couldn't quite put my finger on it with life. And I went to a yoga class with a great teacher called Marielle and I really liked her style. So I followed her on Instagram because that's what I do. I work in social. 
And she started talking about life coaching. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Maybe, maybe I should explore that a little bit. So I met up with her a few times. We went through some bits and pieces and she asked me to do a vision board. Have you done a vision board, Matt? Nope, not yet, personally. Okay. Do you know what one is? Oh, yeah. It's where you yeah. plan out your life, but you put it in a visual way and you try and achieve said things. Exactly. So she said to me, just do it subconsciously. Just like, just cut and paste and stick whatever you want on this piece of paper. Here's a bunch of magazines, go. So it wasn't even like a a planned manifestation. This was literally just to kind of unpick because I was so stuck. I didn't even start. And it's really funny because there's like, there's one bit on there and it's got text and it just says hot Spanish guy. (laughs) Where I got that out from. Um, There's other bits on there, which are all yoga and travel and everything that you would expect from me. And then there's this massive baby head sat right in the middle. And she went, talk to me about that one. And I just booked on to do this other yoga teacher training, which was like the next level up. And the teacher sent an email out and I was like, oh, it's another update on like, she wants more money from me because that's the next installment or whatever. And she went, I'm so sorry, I've got pregnant and I can't travel anymore. So I can't run the the teaching. So if you want to pull out, I totally understand. I'll give you a full refund. I went, okay, yes, please cancel my my course. And I literally picked up the phone the next day and went, I'd like to come in and have a consultation about doing fertility treatment. And that it literally just switched. It was like something in my head went, this is, this is the universe telling you, don't do that, do this. And so, and then my fertility journey kind of then began. I'd like everything else just kind of went out the window then. I was like, just got focus, got to get going to get into the right headspace. What do I need to do? How do I need to be well? Uh, and all the rest of it. And I had one failed attempt at one clinic that wasn't so nice. And out of respect, professional respect for the clinic, I'm not going to go into details about that because it would be quite damning. Um, but I got recommended another clinic uh, down in Woking and they were amazing. They came highly recommended. Several people I know have had success through them. And I had two and a half attempts further um because the third the third one I had to abandon halfway um yeah the third one I was like if this doesn't go to plan it's okay because I'd spent the summer researching adoption and going on zoom calls with people and like learning about what that came into it um so I was like I've got again I've got my plan b I've got my solid foundation and if it doesn't work I'm okay with that because I've given it a go Five days later, you're not supposed to check if you're pregnant until I think it's day 16. Five days later, I literally am sitting at home working, put my stuff down, ran to Waitrose, bought a red onion, a baguette and some cheese, chopped them up and just ate this raw red onion in a baguette. And then I went, I think I might be pregnant. (laughs) Let's hope so. (laughs) I was. (laughs) It was the weirdest feeling. I was just like, I'm sure pregnancy cravings aren't supposed to start that soon, are they? I was just like, what is going on? But yeah, I just really wanted this red onion. Um, and and that was it. And like life just completely changed again. Wow. So can I ask, and you don't have to go into too much detail, but when you said you had that first failed attempt at that clinic, if it was a really bad experience, how do you navigate that to not just sort of go, well, okay, that's not for me. We're going to go down adoption route. Yeah. So I think there were, there were lots of things that were going on there. Um, they say to you, don't put all your eggs in one basket, quite a literal phrase in the fertility world. Um, but the, I think all, I put all my hopes on that one first bet. I was like, yeah, of course it's going to happen to me. Cause the universe said, the yoga course wasn't for me, but I should totally do this here. And I was so set and so focused on it that the drop was really hard. And I remember the way that they told me, because you have to, you have to kind of like have a blood test afterwards. You know, even if you do get your first period, like, uh, and you know, like physically, you know, they still have to test because you can have bleeding and things afterwards. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not pregnant. And I remember getting the phone call and they were just 
I was like, right, okay, well, they're going to tell me no anyway, so I'm preparing myself for that. So I was like, hi. They're like, yeah, just so you know, um, pregnancy test was no, so you're not pregnant. All right, thanks, bye. And I just stood there and was like, what? There's like, I know I'm not pregnant, but you telling me like that just kicked me right in the nuts, and I don't even have nuts. Um, So, yeah, it was pretty harsh. So I was just, I was very emotional for a good few days afterwards and I then I kind of like settled into it a little bit and I was like okay we're just let's just take a breath do we want to keep doing this what's next how do we kind of navigate this and then I went on a couple of dating apps just to see what would happen there because I was just like well you know like nothing's going to hurt me as much as that did so if I (laughs) date doesn't show up on a date it's not going to be a problem um and again just trying to kind of like shift focus trying to find different things and different ways to um to to be in order to not kind of like think too much about it and then I think it was just talking to friends who'd gone through similar experiences whether it was kind of like naturally trying to get pregnant or otherwise just to kind of like remind myself that actually these things take time and you know you if my friend said to me at work he said Steph if if it's not for you it won't go by you like so like trying to remember that actually it will if it's going to happen it will happen for you but only if it's right for you um and it was what I needed to kind of like settle myself and just kind of regroup take a little bit of time out um and so about six months on from that I went on a a solo trip went traveling again but a lot of the trips that I did were in groups, like group tours, because I travel on my own a lot of the time. So I'd meet people and, and friends through those. And this one, I was like, no, you have to do this on your own. And I actually went out to California for three weeks. And I traveled from San Fran down to San Diego and back up to LA and a couple of places in the middle. But I have two friends out there who have both gone through different fertility journeys as solo parents. And so I spent some time with them and their kids and kind of like got to learn a little bit more about the trials and tribulations. One of them had twins, um, first attempts. The other one had nine rounds of uh, treatment and I only got pregnant the last one. So very different experiences. But I was just like, everybody's journey is different stuff. Like you have to remember that. So even though if I look at it straight up facts, I went in, I did a treatment. It didn't work. I had to start again. That's the baseline. The whole experience with the clinic is just wrong and I would not recommend them at all. But the next people that I saw, like honestly, just so welcoming and warm and comforting and supportive and just that everything that I needed to feel safe. And I was, again, dark twist of fate. I was blessed with a global pandemic And I say that because it meant I could bring my stress levels down. I could be at home. I killed my commute, which was sometimes take three hours out of my day. My life was much simpler. And so I was able to get my body in and my mind into a relaxed state enough to be able to feel like welcoming as a, as a host (laughs) um, for a child. So there are so many things in life that seem and are terrible that happen to us or happen around us but actually they create different scenarios that make you and I'm going to quote a children's movie here uh pivot um I don't know if you've seen luck on apple tv no haven't oh my god it's really good um but he they, they talk about how bad luck in life a like it attracts more bad luck like it's one of those things it kind of sticks and then you get into this mindset of it you know, well, that's just me. I just am a bad luck person. And actually, if I had a life of good luck, then everything would be perfect. But actually, you need that bad luck to enable you to pivot, to see better things. And they have this thing in the in the movie called a lucky shot, like a basketball hoop. You kind of like throw it in. You've got all the all these kind of like little creatures down in bad luck that are throwing them in and getting it every time because they've got some good luck behind the machine. They take the good luck out and this basketball goes through the hoop like by past the hoop sorry through a flame lands on the floor melts and solidifies into a frisbee and they'll go frisbee golf anyone and they just throw it 
And you're like, yes, that is the, that is literally how I live my life. It's kind of a, ain't nothing I can do about that. So what should we do about it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You kind of roll with the punches effectively. Exactly, exactly. When you was going through all that stuff, was it a taboo topic or a bit of a stigma that not many people wanted to talk to you about? Because was you still living with your four other uh, friends? So, no, at that point I was living on my own. Um, I do a lot of things on my own. <laughs> Solo parenting. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I was I was living on my own. Um, I would talk to a lot of my work colleagues around it because I've been in the um, the company for, for so long. A lot of people, my mates, we'd kind of grown up together in the agency. I'm a talker, so it helped me to be able to talk. Whether people wanted to listen to me or not, different story but equally there was a fascination with what I was doing and so people did have questions um and I always take that as an invitation to talk more (laughs) and that's and that's good I I asked the question because I know that the topic itself and some topics that we're going through not everyone's welcoming to offer support or support in the right way and where you had done so many things by yourself fine when you're you know 80 percent plus as a person but if you're a little bit less than that or just want companionship just want an ear just want someone in some instances it's not welcome a conversation i don't want to talk about it It makes me feel uncomfortable i don't want to talk about that because it makes me feel uncomfortable but i feel uncomfortable who's going to comfort me yeah and i'm i'm grateful that you was able to have people around you who whom you could talk to and see things and be able to go out and have those conversations because if they weren't forthcoming with the information the people in America that you went and saw mm. I'm sure it, the transition would have been harder to wrap your head around or to understand the pros the cons because it was it wasn't something you could touch hold feel it wasn't tangible it was just an idea it was on your vision board it was just yeah a distant dream that you're hoping will sometimes come to fruition. But once it's there, it's like, add, what is this? And how do I do this? And, oh my gosh, I can't go to the shop ever again. (laughs) This is difficult. Thank God for delivery services, hey. Oh, mate, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. No, but it's, it is, it's, and interestingly though, like I say about talking a lot around things, the, the longer my journey went on with the fertility stuff, the fewer people I would tell. I'd be much more choosy about who I tell because the risks were somewhat higher um, because I knew I was kind of coming to the end of my journey. And just to kind of throw a spanner in the works further, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but my you do a, one of the tests you do at the beginning, they let you know if you're still fertile and they can't count the number of eggs in your system, but they can kind of get an indicator on, on what the the time is that you have left. And so my percentage rates, you, there's a scale of zero to 30 on this scale. 30, you are like locked and loaded, can get pregnant whenever you want. <laughs> zero, you're over, done. Um, my chance of getting pregnant on that scale, I was 0.3. Wow. So, yeah, my little girl wanted to be in this world. <laughs> For real. 100%. So when did you find that out? Was it at the first time of trying or was this during the second clinic? At the first, yeah. And the yeah. second clinic confirmed this as well? Yeah. they'd got. I think it had gone down by the time I'd gone to the second one, which was only... What, to 0.2? Years. Like, I can't remember now, but it, I just remember the 0.3 being the kind of like the key figure. Um but you still backed yourself. You still tried. Yeah. And don't not ask for figures, but I'm taking it wasn't cheap. So IVF is not cheap. IUI, which is a natural version of um, IVF. So IUI is basically a an insemination. Like it, that's literally all it is. And so it's just a case of you monitoring your own body, managing that when you're ovulating, letting them know they do the deed and away you go. So it's it's like being in a relationship, uh, you know, completely natural in that sense. So it's much, much cheaper. IVF was off the table for me because my egg count was so low. Because they were like, we could do this and you could have none. 
so you essentially could trigger early menopause because that that's the, the end of your line so they were like it's much easier for you to try and do it this way um and also from a hormonal perspective it's much kinder on your body because you're not having to kind of go through so much pressure um in that perspective and obviously bandwidth financially was obviously like helpful um to be able to do it so yeah it was much cheaper than I'd envisage envisage it to be and that's why I was able to do it so many times as well with the figure being so low the percentage being so low to the point where it wasn't even a full percentage it was like a fraction what made you feel it was worth the attempts something in me knew I was meant to be a mum and whether that was me as a like a, a natural mum or otherwise I, I just I knew I had to try I just knew it and it's I'm so so incredibly grateful for the fact that it it came to be because my daughter is as every parent will tell you this my daughter is my world um you know she she allows me to see the world through different eyes again um she allows me to share the world with somebody and kind of you know I'm so excited to tell her all about the silverbacks and the, you know, all those other things and go on journeys and stuff with her. But yeah, I I think sometimes you'll, you have to trust your gut. And, and even like, even recently, just uh, from the opposite perspective, there have been things that have come, opportunities that have come my way and I've turned them down because my gut has said no. And people go, why have you done that? And I'm just like, I can't tell you 100%. It just makes me feel really uncomfortable. And so I'm not going to do it. Um, And I think there's always going to be things that you have to do because you've got to survive and you've got to live. But when you when you get to a certain point in life, you you know that the decisions you make have consequences. And if our consequences are not going to serve you well, and there are other things you can do, then you should do the other things because, you know, there's, there's no point in putting yourself through torture that, you know, I could have gone in pursuit of an epilepsy specialist way earlier had I've been knowledgeable enough um, or kind of had I been given the advice to, you might want to check with an epilepsy specialist to get a second opinion, but my opinion is X. Um, my life could have been very different, but it was meant to be the way it's meant to be. And even through the failings of the the first clinic that I went to, I was able to give feedback to the extent that training was given to staff in that clinic to help them better manage their patients. You know, there's a situation I'm going through in my personal life at the moment where the there was, there was some negative stuff that happened, but I know through what I'm doing, something else positive is going to come from this for other people. And so whether I'm that, that vehicle, even for you, Matt, if I'm that vehicle that helps somebody, whether it's myself or you or anybody along the way, then my life has purpose. Um, I feel fulfilled. I feel like I've given back in some way. And I'm not trying to be some kind of evangelical figure here in that sentence, but I think each of us have our own purpose and our own uh, our own reason for being, our own reasons why life happens to us. I know in some religions they talk about the fact that you're only given as much as you can you can bear. And um, I'm not religious, but I've always said to myself, even from a very, very young age, like, and I don't want to cause offense to anybody when I say this, but I went to Sunday school and I remember sitting there going, I don't understand why people are praying to somebody that might exist, but they're not sure, but they're just saying like, can you help me mate? And hoping that he's going to make a difference. I I couldn't get my head around that. And I was like, if there's anything that I can do to make a difference, it's to act. And then at least I know I've tried and I can I can see that it's happened. Funnily enough, I remember chatting to a guy on a dating app just a few years ago. And he was like, I told him the exact same story. And he went, um, that's from the Bible. He just talks about having faith in himself. And then that's, yeah. <laughs> I was like, something went in when I was little, <laughs> clearly. But I took it upon myself. So I'm, I, like I say, I'm not trying to be uh, evangelical about it. But I know that the if you don't try, you just don't know. And uh, if it's not meant to be for you, it's not meant to be for you. But it could be for somebody else or you might be helping someone else along the way. I get that. 
But I guess at the time, not everyone felt that way. And did you feel that way at the time? In, in what respect? In the like all the negative stuff, the the tumor, the fertility treatment that didn't wasn't successful. Did you feel like this is going to benefit other people? Oh no, absolutely not. It's it's uh, I guess it's part of the resilience that you build up because of all those things. And when you get hit with the hard stuff, sometimes the the other things that other people experience that are hard do not feel like they've even touched the surface. So you just glide. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like I remember Brene Brown talking about the fact that um, the misuse of of things like, yeah, but people are starving in Africa, so you should be like counting your blessings. Uh, and she talks about how your your sadness, your kind of angst, your anxieties, everything that you're feeling is valid. 100%. It, it should not be comparable to anybody else's in any different context. So whether it's like, I can't believe it. I paid two pounds for those pair of socks. I've lost one. I've only got a pound's worth of socks left. This is really unfair. And somebody getting upset about it. That's important to them. Whether it's rational or whether it feels like, the, you know, the world is coming to end or not and that's okay, is completely up to that person. It's just what that person is feeling in the moment. And so I think, like I say, for me now, I just look at people and I go, okay, you're having a tough time. That's fine. It's your tough time. For me, easy, but I'm not going to put that in your face. <laughs> yeah. And it's true. It's a bit like, and I'm sure everyone can identify with this at the moment, unfortunately, that cost to live in, not just in the UK, but everywhere in the world. To some people, psh, the price up increase in grocery shopping is going to be a lot more than it will be for someone else. So it's all relative, depending on what your dynamics are and what you're working with. And and that's part of the reason why I enjoy the podcast, because it's everyone telling their own stories and just saying, it's okay to feel what you felt and how you dealt with it. It's just talking about it. And I appreciate everyone that does jump on. And I keep repeating myself, but I, I cannot stress that enough because these are personal stories. When was your lowest point throughout what you've just shared from the diagnosis of the brain tumour, the epilepsy, the failed infertility trials. When was the lowest point for you? It's a really good question. I think there are, there, I'm going to say there are two points because they're quite different. One was that like elongated and that was my diagnosis with the brain tumour because I did not know how to process. Just to add to the kind of colour of the situation at the time, I just lost my stepsister to breast cancer at 36, six months before I got my diagnosis. And I was about to go through Christmas with my family and I couldn't tell them because I didn't want them to know because they didn't, at that stage, I didn't know if it was benign or malignant. So for me, that first year of kind of being diagnosed was painful because I couldn't share it with a lot of people. I just had my kind of immediate universe. I couldn't tell my family. I couldn't understand it fully. I did not know what how it was going to shape my future or if I had a future. So that was pretty intense, but prolonged. And the second one was not getting pregnant that first time because it was literally like falling off a cliff. It was there going from like that. Oh, this is really exciting. I'm going to do this. This is, I've got to put myself through all this. It's like doing the marathon training and then kind of like someone going, yeah, you're going to have your feet amputated tomorrow. That's how it felt. And so, yeah, those were my two lowest points for sure. So I'll answer this question. You go back in time, everything you got right now and what will happen to you in the future remains intact, but you go back in time. You can go back to each of those points. What would you say to the younger version of yourself to help push through and not give up? I would tell myself that linear is not a path that everybody is on. There are so many different ways that your life will go and so many different things that you will not plan to happen, but they will all play a part in shaping who you will become. And you say that both instances? Absolutely. Would you listen to yourself? I don't know if I would listen to myself. That's part of the problem of me being doing everything by myself because quite often my ideas are not traditional and so people go okay she's doing a stuff 
Um, and, you know, whether that be choosing the right options at, you know, for my GCSEs through to kind of going to university when everyone told me I shouldn't go to university because it was too expensive or it doesn't matter. I've always kind of gone with my gut, uh, a little bit against the grain um, and a little bit, well, that people don't do it that way, Steph. And I go, why? <laughs> Valid point. Um, and so, and so that's why I am still single. I'm solo parenting where I'm now freelancing solo like doing all these things not because I can't get on with people because it's all right you've already paid a picture of yourself that's fine you can't <laughs> backtrack now <laughs> um no but it's just it's it's just been the path that's been right for me I do I do find that interesting because you saying that and you might have heard it on previous episodes I I asked that question because I know if I went back in time and I spoke to myself as eloquently as I can now I wouldn't listen I would need to be pulled aside. We're going to have to play some type of game, do bowling, something, and just give me that one-on-one time that I wasn't afforded by my parents all the time because mum raised me as a single parent. My dad wasn't necessarily on the scene all the time. And I know I'd have to probably use a few analogies or show show me what uh, I'm married, that that isn't something I was able to see in my, in my immediate vicinity. So I would have to see it and go, right, look at these people. You see that? You're just seeing it at this, but the reality is all this compromise has taken place prior to it and will happen after it, just to give me that understanding. So I'd have to break it down. But if you can say that lovely little speech and you just get it, hats off to you. You're a better person than me. But I guess <laughs> women are meant to be more mature than guys, I guess. Ish. No, I think it is difficult to listen to anything at different points in your life because the unless you hear something, it's, it's who says it. What, what their kind of like um, background is and what their influence over you is in, in life. Um, like my, I talk about my granddad a lot with my career in the sense that I was choosing between art and languages at school. And he was like, no, you, you know, you're really smart. You need to go into Europe. You need to do languages. You're going to be amazing. You're doing all this. And he came from St. Helena and he traveled like three weeks on a boat to get here. And, you know, and I was like, I had him, on this massive pedestal so I listened to him and I took languages and I'm, I'm really pleased that I did but there are very few other people in my life that I've listened to like I think I, I literally I think he's probably the only one <laughs> wow that's interesting yeah so if you were saying that was it L at the time would you still call it L? and if not what would you call it I wouldn't say it was a loss it was more of okay I'm going to say it is an L Okay. It's luck. Controversial. Because that luck, whether it was good or bad, made me pivot. And through pivoting, I have become the person I am. Very eloquently said. Yeah. Thank you, Apple TV. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting your money's worth. <laughs> That's what matters, what right? Say, it's the best movie. And it's got a black cat in it like mine as well. It's like, it's, yeah. Stick Jane Fonda is a dragon. Whoopi Goldberg's a little captain. It's wicked. All right, I'm going to have to go check that out then. Okay, <laughs> I'll check that out. No, I appreciate that. But what I'll ask you to do for the next two minutes, selfishly plug anything and everything you've got going on, where people can find you. Yeah, go for it. So I am also um, a podcast host. I host For the Love of Kids, which is a podcast all about parenting, but from all sides of of the coin. So by that, I mean, you can be a parent, you can be a non-parent, you can be a don't want to be a parent, um, but trying to get perspectives of how becoming a parent or your friends becoming a parent impact who you are, who you become. I know from my perspective that my life has changed, the language has changed that I use, the way I live has changed. My social life has changed. Um, my priorities have changed. Um, and yet in my head, much like you were saying about marriage earlier, I didn't know what it looked like on the other side. You can only imagine things until they happen to you. And so whether that might be a friend of mine who suddenly sees me in a different light and does or doesn't want to be there, now or you know people that have been attracted into my life because I've become parent the trials and tribulations everything that goes into it that's all about that so it's called for the love of kids um other than that 
me, I'm Steph. I'm a marketing consultant. I'm there for all your social media and marketing needs. <laughs> Indeed. Um, uh, and yeah, that's where I kind of get a kick out of life. I like to be able to help people do big, bigger and better things, but more things that matter. So making sure that they are valuable and purposeful. I might try and help you sell your trainers, but it's not really my bag. I'd much rather help people do things that are for the greater good. There we go. Hit her up. Details will be in the show notes. There's a lot of things I felt like I may have known about you. A lot of things I definitely didn't know about you, but I appreciate you sharing and just showcasing what people sometimes go through because what I said at the beginning, I stand by because that is what I think of you and what I'm grateful for you. However, I was not aware of all of what I said about you having that under the surface. And I think a lot of people in general, we see what we see on the surface level and assume that's everything that that person is and that everything was lucky prior to that. That got them there. They didn't know there was some bad luck in there and other things in there. And these conversations just pulls the veil back and lets people see behind the curtains and say, wow, you got all this going on. Yep. And you're still showing up. Yep. How? I don't know. I'm just putting one foot in front of the other until I can't anymore. And that's what I'm grateful for because a lot of us, I don't promote it and I don't think I ever would. I would never encourage a person to sit and watch BBC News or Sky News or whatever, CNN, whatever, because that will just cause you to pick up a sharp blade and do something to yourself. Not worth it. You kind of need to watch your diet, not just what you eat, but what you consume on social and on TV because it can change your mindset. And hopefully if you consume conversations like this podcast your podcast and other people that are like that it will change your mindset to a positive one where you're more aware of the people in your social circle and the impact your actions or your inactions are actually causing but hopefully you'll see that in this instance this this very challenging very hard wearing journey that Steph has been on through so many ups and downs and all around she was able to find something where she's happy with the place that she's at and who she's got in her life, which may not seem like a reality at one point. And to you listening, I don't know what's going on in your life, what you've been through, what you're going through, but who's to say that what you're going through won't lead you to the version of yourself that you want to be, who you need to be, and will have more than what you ever thought you could have. And it kind of goes back to what I always say, which is there's nothing about a caterpillar. I tell you, it's going to be a butterfly. I hope you have a great day, great night, great whatever you're doing at this time. And I'll catch you in the next one. Mm-hmm.